Okay, so attempt number five to record this without including a rant. And why would it include a rant? Well, for that, you might need to lessen the next week's build prompts because that might have the rant in it instead. So, why retire admirals in a world war? This is one of those questions which was... Both at the same time, easy and difficult to answer. Difficult to answer because some of the sources are frankly terrible. Easy to answer because most of it actually follows common sense when you apply simple logic. There is my favourite source, who of course has all sorts of weird reasons why, but seeing as that's the same source which basically takes the fact that both Britain and America had plans for war, were doing war plans against each other as proof that they were actually planning to go to war with each other, rather than both thinking, hang on, who's the largest potential opponent in the world? Hmm, it's the other one. Well, it that's therefore the toughest theoretical opponent we could actually face other than fighting ourselves, so it's good planning to actually have a plan for it. That's good training. But also, there's always the case that something weird really happens and you do end up in that scenario. And that's not kind of scenario against the biggest potential. You want to be caught with your, um, let's put it this way, trousers around your ankles. It's not a good scenario for that to happen. So, you have a plan. Are you seriously including on that plan? No! For goodness sake, the... Some of the reconnaissance for the British war plans against America were conducted by Canadian army officers travelling around Northern America on buses in uniform at one point, taking pictures as they went, and actually stopping and meeting several National Guard units and having drinks with them. And when I say, uh, what well, the reason I haven't put too many facts is because I'm not quite sure if that was actually part of the planning process or was just, oh, we have this information because these guys went on this tour and they have it available. But there you go. Bus ride reconnaissance. <sighs> so let's uh, get the things first. There are some books you will read which will tell you that this is all guaranteed. It's not. At no point has it ever been guaranteed. Midshipman to lieutenant, sort of, sort of, at certain points, sort of, but there is a very small number who don't make it. Always. Lieutenant to lieutenant commander. It's rare, but more common than midshipman not getting to lieutenant. Lieutenant Commander to Becoming Commander. Again, rare. But a lot more common than lieutenant uh, than lieutenants not getting to Lieutenant Commander as a percentage of the group. Commander the Captain, that's a big step. That even today is a big step. In fact, today it's a massive step. These are steps which have just got bigger as time has gone on. Okay? Uh, there is one famous historian's book which declares that officers going to Admiral rank in prior to World War One had no selection. Mm? <laughs> oh, you poor little summer child. There was tons of selection going on. I, If you want to go find out more details, please go look up my great colleague Simon Harley. He's amazingly obsessive with his research of World War One admirals and where they come from and how they're selected and how the Royal Navy is dealing with their promotion and sculpting their careers. Trust me, there is selection going on. They don't just go, you know what, you're the senior captain, you now become an admiral. No, they don't. 
And believe it or not, because believe it or not, they have methods of getting rid of you. They can retire you. They do quite regularly. Uh, you're too old now. I'm sorry. You're retired. Or you haven't got enough sea time to become an admiral. Really? But you're the guy, you're the people who arrange sea time, who give me command of ships. And you're now saying you haven't given me enough sea time to become an admiral. I know. Mayor Culpa. Unfortunately, there's the door. There are all sorts of ways to weed out people. So, not every commander becomes a captain, not every captain becomes a rear admiral, not every rear admiral becomes a vice admiral, not every vice admiral becomes an admiral, and not every admiral becomes an admiral of the fleet. Currently, Queen Elizabeth and the late Duke of Edinburgh are got to be Lord High Admiral, but for many years, that title was held in commission by the Lords of the Admiralty in the Admiralty Board. And please note, as I've put here, and this has caused much distress amongst people, this is actually a real thing. You can read Captain Michael Clapp's book on the Falklands War, and it will tell you exactly this. I have heard it from him myself. So Commodore was not a substantive rank until very recently in the Royal Navy, which meant captains were acting Commodores, or Commodore Pennant. Not Commodore Flag, Commodore Pennant, which means they have a triangular signal instead of a square one. Or rectangular. And would do duty as a Commodore, and even if you had, it was no guarantee of you becoming a re uh, becoming even a rear admiral. Case in point, Michael Clapp, Commodore of the Task Group in 1982 Falklands War, does a great job, widely praised, retires as a captain later that year. As scheduled, because it was decided that allowing war experience to affect promotions would be unfair on those who hadn't managed to deploy. There is a codicil I can add to that story, whereby later on, after he's retired, got himself, his family moved into a new job, into a new home with a new job, um, all the kids in school, everything set up. So we're talking months after retirement. Someone from the Navy rings up and goes, you know what, would you mind coming back? We'd like to have you come and serve for at least another year or so as a rear admiral, because we'd like to use your intelligence. Will you give me any more time after that? we can't guarantee you promotion beyond that or a service beyond a year. So you want him to give up his entire job, move his family for a, only a year's guaranteed employment. I can't think why he said no. Can you? So qualitative or quantitative approach. That would be the options for analyzing this. Um, I could go for a quantitative and look at all the st stats and figures and add them all up. Unfortunately, there are literally hundreds of them. Hundreds. And I had about a week to put this all together. But also, there are hundreds of them. And I would have to spend the entire time in the National Archives going through their personal files to be really sure about what was written down, let alone what was really the reason for them being retired. So... I flipped on its head, and I thought, well, I'll look at it qualitatively. And then I thought, I'll flip that on its head, and I, instead of looking at the people who are retired, I'll look at the people who were called back from retirement. Because if it shows you why the people were called back from retirement, which they tend to be more honest about, it gives you an idea of why some people were allowed to retire and weren't called back from retirement. So why did you call the people back from retirement? It's an old trick of history. How do I answer a question? Well, it's very difficult to prove a double negative, and it's very, very difficult to prove something in the absence of information. So I have to first look around and find out what do I have information about? What do I have access to information about that I can prove? And can this provide me with a logical answer and response to this answer? In this case, the one reason people were called back from retirement basically can tell me a lot about the people who weren't called back from retirement. And yes, I have a very cool person pictured here. I also have a fluff which is demanding a biscuit. This cool person you are going to learn about shortly. Um, if you thought Carton de Weert was an interesting character, this gentleman is his naval counterpart. Very arguably. So, so Albert Percy Addison, born 8th of November 1875, years of service, 1889 
1929. So he did... Well, <laughs> no. If I'm not mistaken, that's 11 plus 29 years, which is 40 years of service. Fairly decent. And then 1939 to 1946. Oh, and between 1929 and, well, 1928 and 1937, he was serving as director of dockyards to the Admiralty, which you can discuss as to whether or not that's actually a civilian posting. Because technically he's an admiral and retired in that posting, but let's be honest, that's a pretty senior role to run the dockyards and administer the dockyards for the, Navy, uh, for the Navy. He'd been Rear Admiral Destroyers uh, for the Mediterranean Squadron. He'd been Rear Admiral Commanding Her Majesty's Australian Fleet. Well, His Majesty's Australian Fleet, not time. Uh, he'd been in charge of the Night Submarine Flotilla and also Atrium's Mainsman. Uh, Atrimus E-52 as well. Atrimus Dartmouth, Atrimus Bonaventure, Atrimus Hazard. Yeah. He's recalled to service. He is an expert in how you run dockyards. He spent 10 years doing it. And so when they are, find themselves running a lot of dockyards... The guy who succeeded him needs a new uh, needs a troubleshooter because suddenly they have everything being needed to be done in triplicate and a lot quicker, and they're having to coordinate a lot more yards, a lot of civilian yards. They call him back. He has a lot of experience in running yards, and he has a lot of experience in understanding ships and submarines. He understands the destroyers and submarines, which are going to be pretty darn important to this conflict, and he understands shipyards. So yes, he's called back, and he's very useful. So Henry Percy Douglas. He unfortunately dies in November 1939, which is really fricking annoying. Frigating annoying, in fact. Because he'd been chairman of the Dover Harbour Board for about six years, uh, chairman of the board of the British Graham Land Expedition, uh, that's why there's parts of Antarctica named after him. But in 1939, September, he's appointed as Commodore Superintendent Donover. Let's consider his career. Born 1st November 1879, years of service in 1890 to 1932, and then on to 1939. What did he do? Uh, what's he, his skill? Oh, he's one of the world's best hydrographers. Literally one of the world's best hydrographers in his period. Uh, hence his commander of HMS Waterwitch, Mutine, Ormond, and hydrographer of the Navy, 1924 to 1932. That's not a post you ho hold for eight years if you are not exceptionally good at your job. After retiring in 1932, he was acting conservator of the River Mersey and nautical assessor of the House of Lords. In simple terms... You couldn't have someone who understood more about Dover or the Mersey. Knew more about their tides, knew more about the whole <laughs> seabed around them, and understood them at this time. So very useful. Would have been really, really useful to Ramsey. I mean, Ramsey finds some people who have similar levels of skill, luckily, but... He would, under no circumstance, have said, no, I, I have enough of these people. If you would had another ones wandering around, he'd have been going, thank you very much. Richard Bell Davies, who was pictured earlier. Let me just read his career out before we discuss him. So, born the 19th of May, 1886. Years of service, 1901 to 1944. Died 26th of February, 1966, age 79. So you must be going, well, Alex, he retires in 1944. No, he doesn't. He retires earlier than that. He retires several times. Commands held HMS Pretoria Castle, HMS Dasher, and Rear Admiral Naval Air Stations, HMS Cornwall, HMS London, and number three, Squadron Royal Naval Service. Now, some of you are probably sitting there going, hang on, how does a Rear Admiral end up being in charge of escort carriers? Well, we're following that. So his DSO citation, which he earned in 1915. 
These officers have repeatedly attacked the German submarine station at Ostend and Zeebrugge, uh, being subject on each occasion to heavy and accurate fire. Their machines being frequently hit, in particular on 23rd of January, they each discharged eight bombs and attacked upon submarines alongside the mole at Zeebrugge. Flying down to clo uh, close range at the outset of this um, flight, Lieutenant Davies was severely wounded by a bullet in the thigh, but nevertheless, he accomplished his task, handling his machine for now with great spill and uh, in spite of pain and loss of blood. He also gets a Victoria Cross in World War I for the first combat search and rescue by aircraft in history. The King has been graciously pleased to approve of the grant of the Victoria Cross to the Squadron Commander Richard Bell Davies, DSO, RN, and of the Distinguished Service Cross to Flight Superintendent uh, Gilbert Formby Smile, Royal Navy, in recognition of their behavior in the following circumstances. On 19th November, these two officers carried out an air attack on Ferrich Junction. Flight Superintendent Smile's machine was received by very heavy fire and brought down. The pilot planned a plane down over the station, releasing all his bombs except one, which failed to drop simultaneously at the station from a very low altitude. Thence he continued his descent into the marsh. On alighting, he saw that one of the, uh, the ex un one unexploded bomb and set fire to his machine, knowing that the bomb would ensure its destruction. He then proceeded towards Turkish territory. At this moment, he perceived Squadron Commander Davies descending, and fearing that he would come down near the burning machine and bust the risk destruction from a bomb, Flight Sub Senate Smiley ran back and, fr and from a short distance exploded the bomb by means of a pistol bullet. Squadron Commander Davies descend and descended as the safe distance from the burning machine, took up Sub Senate Smiley in spite of the near approach of the party and the enemy, and returned to the aerodrome, a feat of AM in a ship that can seldom have been equal for get skill and gantry. So, when does he retire? Well, he's a Vice Admiral on the 29th of May 1941, and in line to become 5th Sea Lord in charge of the Royal Naval Air Service. However, that's going to be a boring desk job. So he retires. He then joins the Royal Navy Reserve, accepts a reduction in rank to, the command, to a commander, and was therefore able to serve as a convoy commodore. Then commissioned as a captain, he is put in charge of an escort carrier after escort carrier to get them ready for this auction and take them into combat. Oh, and he finally leaves the R&R &R in 1944. So let's consider this officer. Ah... Uh... First of all, he has a Victoria Cross as well as a DSO. So, one day, he's your boss. You're a rear admiral. He's a vice admiral. The next day, he's in your office as a Royal Navy Reserve commander. Let's examine how you deal with this person. Uh, that's a bit of an issue, Convoy Commodore. He's a very experienced, very capable, very, very skilled naval aviator, and pretty darn useful. Here are these two. Ah, it's the Sydney Bailey. Retired Admiral in 1939. Recalled to service in World War II, ran the Bailey Committee, which examined the level of naval assistance to be sought from the United States. Bailey and his American counterpart, Robert L. Gomley, would work hand in hand throughout the war, sorting out issues as they arose. Unfortunately, he dies on the 27th of March, 1942, age 59. But let's be honest, he actually had a few good innings in him. If he hadn't died when he did, and frankly, one of the reasons he does die is there's a strong rumour that he, deny, he refuses treatment in order so he can carry on doing his work. And this is what we're dealing with. We're dealing with a guy who's basically going, yeah, uh, I don't need treatment. Uh, if I'm going to die, I'm going to die in the saddle. But he would have been very, very useful. And he was recalled because he was good at diplomacy and he was good at managing multinational relations. Alban Thomas Buckley Curtis. Second commander of the Home Fleet from 1941, led Operation Harpoon in 1942, was Commander-in-Chief American West Indies Station 1942-4, to retired in 1944. There was nowhere else really for him to go. He wasn't going to go up any further. And you do have a scenario where if you don't let the people go at the top, you can't promote the people below, because you only have so many admiral slots and so many vice admiral slots. And you can't promote someone to a vice admiral and keep them in a rear admiral spot. 
you need to be able to promote the people who are doing well below. But also, he's worn out. Look at that list of operations. Second in command of the home fleet from 1941. That's not going to be a quiet job. Led Operation Harpoon in 1942. Not exactly an easy role. Was Commander-in-Chief American West Indies Station 1942-4. to That's not exactly going to be a picnic, is it, either? In those years. Honestly, he's had a hard war. It's He's probably whacked out. So Ragnar Musgrave Colvin, um, a gentleman who I'm never quite sure if he actually understood the what meant uh, what the words medically retired meant. Born the seventh of May, 1882, served 1896 to 1944. Notice that even the Royal Navy doesn't try and claim he actually retired when he was supposed to. Um, died 22nd of February, 1954, age 71. And let's be honest, that is one of the coolest names you're ever going to hear. Sir Ragnar Musgrave Colvin. You know, let's be honest. Richard Bell Davies, really cool. Really, really cool guy. But the n cool name goes to Sir Ragnar Musgrave Colvin. Come on. Commands held, as said. Chief of the Australian Naval Staff. Royal Naval College Greenwich. He was president of it. Second Battle Squadron. HMS Revenge. HMS Caradoc. He, he's done cruiser, he's done a battleship, he's done a battle squadron. Okay, yes, it was the Isles, but you know, it's still, it's still a battle squadron. Still counts. And retirements. Well, um, due to failing health, retired home to the UK in 1942-ish. Late 1941, early 1942. Then spends... The rest of the next two years serving as naval advisor to the Australian High Commission in London and making sure that the Australians are getting all the equipment and all the st stuff they need. Making sure that absolutely no one forgets the Antipodean gentlemen and ladies fighting the war and their needs and especially things like radar and technology and information. Really does a good job for that. Sir George Frederick Bassett Edward Collins. Now. Oh. Born 26th of December, 1883. Served 1898 to 1944. Died 17th of February, 1958. Command held. Flag officer commanding Gibraltar and the Mediterranean approaches. 18th Cruiser Squadron. Second Cruiser Squadron, HMS Renown, HMS Canis, and HMS Carisford. Now, 18th Cruiser Squadron is the force set up at the beginning of World War II using all the town class cruisers that could be grabbed to try and hunt for any German surface raider trying to get out. Hello. Yes, I know. It had been a very high-stress posting, I would argue. And then he's moved on to command Gibraltar. Not exactly a low-stress one. And he does that till he retires. Until September 1943, he is in charge of Gibraltar. And the Western approaches. Well, the Mediterranean, uh, the Mediterranean approaches. Sorry. At some point, it's called part of the Atlantic Western approaches. And I'm not getting into it. But he commands this area. That's a tough gig, if there is one. And then he retires in 1944. Again, where is the full admiral going to go? Is he going to become first sea lord? No, Cunningham's got that job. <clears throat> okay, is he going to go to command the Pacific Fleet? No. How many full admirals do you need in the UK running things? Uh, not that many. Where else are you going to send him? Where does he want to go? Does he feel tired after doing all that for those years? That's a good question. More officers without pictures. Uh, Sir Henry John Stunderhold and Brownrigg. Served as captain of HMS Courageous in 1929 before becoming director of naval ordnance in 1931. 
Paul de Bell Davis, retired from the Navy in 1939, served then as officer commanding the Home Guard at Chatham, 1940-41, then became a convoy commodore, was actually in charge of organising convoy commodores, and nominated himself for the role at one point. Uh, sailed on convoy uh, ON-16, uh, or ON-16, which was off, of course, to New York, in the SS Ville de Tom uh, um, a free French vessel. Sailing on the 12th of January 1940, well, it'd been Vichy French, which we then taken over, and there's a dispute for free French and British, but it was under control. Sailing on the 12th of January 1943, the ship was lost with all hands on 24th January 1943, which included, of course, its convoy Commodore aboard. Came out of service, came back, went down. Hector George Boys. Well, this is a very special person. In 1915, the then Lieutenant Commander Boys took command of the gunboat HMS Fissel in the East African Campaign. In so good fighting, he was mentioned in dispatches seven times, earned the Order of St. Michael and St. George, and the Portuguese Order of Aviz. <laughs> Married in 1919 in um, Archangel, that's Russia. A half Norwegian, half Danish lady, Eleonora Bill de Falsen, who was daughter of a diplomat, uh, when he was 38 and she was 20. They did have a son. They seem to have been together for the rest of their lives. Very, as far as I can see, happy. Retired a rear admiral in 1934, then appointed as, captain, uh, as a captain, uh, as a naval attache in Oslo. Mm hmm. This is where some really interesting stuff begins. Managed to be critical in producing what became known as the Oslo Report by liaising with a German mathematician who wanted to give away, or in theory, a physicist, who wanted to give away all the information on German weapons he could, and he sends a note to Captain the then Captain Boys in Oslo, would you like this information? And Captain Boys goes, yes, and then arranges everything to get the information and to try and keep the information flowing as long as possible. Unfortunately, Denmark is actually invaded. So their plan to get information out through neutral Denmark doesn't work. But they had plans going on. Uh, after this time, he's sent to continue his attaché role in Tokyo, where he does some other rather interesting work in getting a lot of information out of Japan. No one's quite sure how he does it again. And then he gets sent to, well, when he, of course, you know, there's an outbreak of the Pacific War, a war in the Pacific, and, you know, all the diplomats are sent away. He goes to Latin America and gets posted lots of embassies in Latin America, where he manages to, again, have in interesting times uh, with various, how do I put this? He seems to always be not far away when the pro various pro-German movements in Latin America have problems. Never, never there himself, you know, never far away. Uh, retired again in 1947, died in 1960. Again, someone you will never hear about, but is certainly a very critical person to World War Two and to how it was prosecuted. Sir Geoffrey Schoenberg Abuffnot. So, born on the 18th of January 1885, served 1990-46, died 4th of October 1957, age 72. Commands health, chairman of the Honours and Awards Committee, commander chief East Indies Station, 4th Sea Lord, HMS Valiant, HMS Suffolk and HMS Seawolf. So this is a kind of interesting one because I would consider being made chairman of the Honours and Wards Committee pretty much a retirement. Despite its being critical to morale, it does make you retire. But also, the more I thought about it, it's also an interesting way of keeping you actually in the service. So it's kind of like saying, well, we have officers who are better, who we're going to be using. But if they die or get killed, we don't want you off being a convoy commodore or anything else you might desire. So we're going to give you this role, which is honourable and important enough. You're going to 
probably sit there and be happy. And remember, as chairman of the Honours and Awards Committee, you have to be read into all sorts of secret mission reports and profiles to write people up for their Honours and Awards, to work out how to give them Honours and Awards occasionally when nothing's going to be circulated about why they're really getting this award. So you have to write up something which will give them the award, but won't reveal how they got it. Quite a critical role for morale, but it's also a good way of keeping him nicely where you need him in case you need him for something else. I'm not quite sure from his background where he would have been necessarily sent. There is part of me which sort of wonders if he's a, to an extent, a backup for Somerville. Because technically, you know, East Indies Station. There is a part of me which wonders if he's a backup for Somerville. In that they've got him sitting there just in case they need a son and someone to immediately take command if something happens to Somerville. But I don't know. I can never I can never prove it. But it's interesting that he's put into this chairman of the honors awards uh, of the honors and awards committee role, which is a role which is important enough it's going to keep him busy. Not so important you can't yank him out of it. But it's also conversely it means he doesn't get to go. I will now resign because this is a boring and pointless staff job and go off and become a convoy commodore. Which a disturbingly large number of them do. You find out quick, uh, quite a lot of the retirement, uh, retired officers basically retire and disappear off to become convoy commodores. Uh, there is an old joke of them being mostly retired captains. Actually, it seems quite a large number of them were retired admirals and above. Um, <laughs> it seems to me if you're a retired captain, you usually get something a little bit smaller than a con you uh, you're an R and R here. Have a trawler, yes, thank you. Or uh, here, have a Corvette. There are the Royal Navy does use a lot of retired officers in various form of versions of reserve in World War Two, and they get used. They have this pool of experience, and they're not going. They're going to pull from it shamelessly. So Alexander Robert Maul Ramsey, another Royal Naval Air Service officer, uh, born 29th May 1881, served 1894 to 1942, died October 1972, aged 91. Now, he was 5th Lord and Chief of Naval Air Services, uh, 1938 to 9, so he was the first one back when the Royal Navy really got back control of the fleet air arm. Commander-in-Chief, East Indies Station, 1936-8. Rear Admiral Aircraft Carriers, 1933-6. So he was the second in that role after Henderson. And uh, uh, Captain HMS Furious before that. Now, he was in many ways Henderson's protégé, to an extent, instead of uh, securing naval aviation development. Now, he makes Admiral in 1939. He retires in 1942. He hasn't had an active post in those years. But he's been around. I think in many ways he was probably slightly annoyed that his certain Lord Corkinori got sent to uh, Norway rather than him. But he was also around trying to help various officers in the Sea Lords, etc. doing their posts, especially Bruce Fraser, who took over after Henderson. Now, one of the interesting things about him was they were always slightly worried about him getting into problems. It's basically it's the Duke of Edinburgh effect because he was married to Princess Patricia of Connaught, who was a granddaughter of Queen Victoria, so he was a minor royal. Not really an active royal, but a minor royal. He would go to all the family events. He and his wife would, and they were they were part of the family. So there was a lot of people who were very worried over what happens if he gets killed. He does die age 91 in 1972, so if you think about it, and take, don't take this the wrong way, he is 60 when he retires, so he is technically of the age he should retire when he does, and you can understand why perhaps they haven't been deploying him, but he's also an awful lot of experience. And I think they're kind of lucky he didn't decide to turn around and become a convoy commodore, Probably because his wife told him if she if he did, she'd be sailing alongside him. Uh, Princess Patricia was no wilting violet. 
Uh, and Dame Elvira Sybil Marie Lawton Matthews. Now, she's always a good one for me to bring up because she was the daughter of Sir John Knox Lawton. Sir John Knox Lawton is the person and is the naval historian for whom the chair of naval history at King's College London is named after. I.e., the premier chair of naval history in the world, arguably, in the War Studies Department currently held by Professor Andrew Lambert, the post which, frankly, every naval historian who's an academic naval historian secretly wants, even if they don't admit it out loud, it's what we all want to do. It's our dream job. Because it basically means you are it as far as naval histori history is concerned while you're holding that post. Now, born the 20th of September, 1888, uh, years of service, 1918 to 19, and 1939 to 46. Died 25th September, 1959, age 71. Martin's held, of course, the Women's Royal Naval Service. She was director. Which is an interesting rank to have, because technically it's not a rank, but also scared the bejesus out of a few admirals. Um, you didn't want to be mucking around with her girls. Of course, quite a lot of the people involved in things like Bletchley Clark, etc., were Wrens. Uh, there were a large number of them around in various departments, and she was in charge of looking after all of them and making sure they were being respected and well looked after. Hence, Mrs. Churchill has come to pay her a visit. And again, a, a very, very influential woman. Um, she was also affiliated with a girl, a girl guide. She was a commissioner of them. Uh, skipper of the Sea Rangers, Chairman of St. Joan's Social and Political Alliance, uh, Chairman, Domestic Coal Consumers Council, uh, President, National Smoke Abatement Society, Affairs on the Gas Board Council, uh, Life President, Association of Wrens, President of St. Joan's International Social and Political Alliance, Chair of the Status of Women's Committee, St. Joan's Social and Political Alliance, President, Mermaid Swimming Club, Member, Council Girl of the Girls, uh, of the Girl, Council Girls uh, Guides Association, and President of the British Federation of Business and Professional Women. Look, she is incredibly scary. She's called back to run a service which is basically set up with the focus on making sure as many of the, at the time, fighting men could go to war as possible by freeing up as much of the backroom support staffs, shore posts, as possible. She was constantly pushing to expand those roles. There were a few admirals who remarked that actually a way to win the war would be to parachute her into Berlin. Within five minutes, Hitler would have surrendered. That's going to make YouTube out the me. But the point is, there were a, this was a formidable person who was called back to run a very critical department and took no prisoners in doing it, which was important. Because you couldn't. <laughs> you couldn't in wartime. Now, as you probably heard, there is someone sitting here going, Papa, it's time for me to be given lots of fuss and attention. He'll get it in a bit. So this is some of the admirals who serve in the Admiralty during World War II. Some of them. Not all of them. You have Sir Dudley Pound and... Andrew Cunningham are, of course, the first sea lords during World War II. You have a deputy first sea lord, Sir Charles Kennedy Purvis. You have a second sea lord, chief naval personnel, that's Sir Charles Little, William Whitworth, and Algernon Willis. Third sea lord, of course, taking over after Henderson was Rear Admiral Bruce Fraser, then followed by Vice Admiral Frederick Wake Walker, who would die 
in September 1945. So basically, this post had killed Henderson. Fraser survives. Wa Walker dies. Yeah. Third Sea Lord. Nice, easy set of post. Fourth Sea Lord and Chief of Supplies and Transport, Rear Admiral Jeffrey Abuffnot. Promoted to Vice Admiral in May 1940. Then Vice Admiral John Cunningham. Then Vice Admiral Frank Peregrim. And Vice Admiral Arthur Palliser. Remember, ranks tend to go up as the service increase. The Royal Navy increases to very nearly 800,000 personnel during World War II. So suddenly you need a lot more experienced people running things. Or rather, they need to have more oomph on their sleeve to get things done. Fifth Sea Lord and Chief of Naval Aviation. Uh, we have Vice Admiral Sir Alexander Ramsey, then Sir Guy Royal, then Lumley Lister, then Desmond Boyd, and Thomas Rubridge. Now, Sir Guy Royal, poor guy, comes in. Now, as I've said, mentioned already earlier, Bell Davies was really the person who was supposed to take over after Ramsey. When Bell Davies decides to go and become a convoy commodore, Guy Royal has to come up. And then Lumley Lister. And then Desmond Boyd. So that's why those two officers, who could have been used in other roles, weren't available for those other roles. And one reason, because you need the experience to run the fleet air arm. Then there's the naval staff, which support the Admiralty. Deputy Chief of Naval Staff. Uh, Admiral, Rear Admiral Sir Tom Phillips, then made Acting Vice Admiral in 1939. Vice Admiral Henry Moore, and then Vice Admiral Neville Sivert. Then there's the Assistant Chief of Naval Staff, where, and before duties are split. Uh, Rear Admiral Harold Burrow. Assistant Chief of Naval Staff, Foreign. Vice Admiral Geoffrey Blake, Rear Admiral Henry Harwood, Rear Admiral Bernard Rawlings, Rear Admiral Reginald Saves, Rear Admiral Edward Bellas, Assistant Chief of Naval Staff Home, Rear Admiral Arthur Power, Rear Admiral Patrick Brind, Rear Admiral pa Desmond McCarthy, Assistant Chief of Naval Staff Rear Admiral Henry Moore, Rear Admiral Edward King, Rear Admiral John Elston, Rear Admiral John Dundas, Rear Admiral John Mansfield. Assistant Chief Naval Staff Weapons, Rear Admiral Roderick McGregor, Rear Admiral Wilfred Parsons, Assistant Chief Naval Staff Air, Rear Admiral Reginald Portal, Rear Admiral Lachlan McIntosh, Director of Naval Intelligence, Rear Admiral John Godfrey, and then Rear Admiral Edmund Bus uh, Rushbrook. Other appointments, well, there's the Naval Secretary, Rear Admiral Stuart Bonham Carter, Rear Admiral Neville Sifrit. Rear Admiral Arthur Peters, Rear Admiral Frederick Dalrymple Hamilton, Rear Admiral Cecil Harcourt, Rear Admiral Claude Barry, Director of Personnel Service, Rear Admiral Henry Prindon Whitfield, Rear Admiral William Trait, Rear, Rear Admiral Harold Walker, Rear Admiral Harold Kinnan, Vice Controller, Francis Tower, Vice Admiral Francis Tower, who also had the title Director of Naval Equipment. Deputy Controller, Rear Admiral James Dawling, Rear Admiral Charles Simeon. And if you notice, some of these officers are retired. Yes, they are retired officers who've been drawn back from. So they're retired, yet they've been called back to serve in this role and assist. Engineering Chief, Vice Admiral George Priest, Vice Admiral Frederick Turner, Vice Admiral John Kingham. Director of Dockyards, Vice Admiral, retired, Francis Talbot, who gets a bit of promotion up to being Vice Controller. So his role is technically taken over by Engineer Rear Admiral Son Dunlop, uh, Samuel Dunlop. But remember, he's still running the Dockyards, and Samuel Dunlop is doing the job as well. But also, our first gentleman, who we discussed, called back. Recall the service, 1939, retired April 1946. Ooh, he is called back at exactly the same time. His successor is promoted to take on the role of Vice Controller. Adjutant General Royal Marines, General Sir William Godfrey, Lieutenant General Alan Bourne, and Lieutenant General Thomas Hunton.
Running a military in a world war is never going to be an easy task. Running a military the size and scale of the Royal Navy in a world war is a Herculean task for a whole clan of Hercules. Or Herculeses. Hmm. Is Hercules like aircraft in that there can be one aircraft or ten aircraft? So can it be one Hercules? Ten Hercules? Doesn't need to be Herculeses. So I'm going to go with Hercules. So, as both a singular and a plural. These are all individuals. They're called that. And again, you have to remember, it's kind of like Tent Destroyer Flotilla in the run-up to, uh, to D-Day. Uh, the Allies could select any destroyers they wanted. Any destroyers they wanted would be formed into that flotilla. If there was a better destroyer than the tribal class for the role going anywhere, they could have gone and got it. There would have been no qualms. Remember, this is for the critical security of D-Day. This is after there had been so many issues with exercises being invaded by German torpedo boats, Schnellboots, e-boats. There wasn't going to be any questioning. There wasn't going to be any debating. If they'd wanted those ships, they got those ships. So when they say they're picking the tribals, that's the ones they're happy with. When they're picking the officers from the retired list, from the service list, they are not going to pick anything but the best available candidate for the role. There are some limitations, though. Sometimes the best available candidate for the role takes himself off, retires, and decides they want to go and do an active job. Again. Imagine being the officer trying to give Commander Bell Davies an order. Um, I am the only one who thinks that that order would be counted. If you wouldn't mind, if you feel like it's the right appropriate time, perhaps when you've had your morning breakfast and repast and are feeling fully refreshed, could you possibly, if if you consider it the right action, of course, and, you know, are willing and happy to do so, um, could you possibly, if, you know, if it's right with you, um, take a watch... Bell Davies? Of course, old boy. <laughs> Captain collapsing on the floor going... <laughs> but no, Convoy Commodore and then in charge of his own ships probably about sensible advice for them. I'm still fairly certain that every single order that was sent to that ship, was, that any of those ships or convoys, was probably triple signed by a full admiral. <laughs> Why is the first sea lord worked to death? Well, for starters, he has to sign all the orders to the convoy commodores personally. Why? Because they all outrank everyone else. Not quite that bad. And they're very professional, and they do it properly, but I can still imagine it being quite fun. So why do you retire in World War II? Why do you retire in Admiral? Because you want to promote other people, and you haven't got your limitless space for them. But also, because some of them, because you've worked to the point at which they cannot work anymore. They are physically, emotionally trained. You know, Many family members describe these officers having gone into the war being gregarious, large characters, or, la or large in life, and being drained after the war because of what they had had to do. There are some who maintain that the whole way through the same soul, or the same soul and personality. no matter what they see. Honestly, an example I tend to give is Philip Vian. But Philip Vian is 
an exception rather than a rule. Everyone involved in the world war is changed. No one comes out the same. But what are those officers who retire and aren't called back? Does that mean they're bad? No. It means often they're just not as good. You don't really get to be a rear admiral or higher in the Royal Navy in this period and not be good at your job. I know people often go, well, there's patronage and there's the things, and there is Lord Cork and Ori. But he had actually had a pretty darn good career and had done fairly well prior to that. Don't ask me what happens when he's called back and ends up going to Norway, because frankly, the guy who goes out there is not the guy who'd been in the Royal Navy prior to that. I'm not sure what had happened to him, but he suddenly... He's obsessed with fighting a war with the British Army rather than fighting the war with the Germans. And the British Army commander is no better. He's obsessed with fighting the war with the Royal Navy, not the Germans. So frankly, it's a match made in heaven for those two and in heaven for the Germans, but not for anyone else. And the successes you see in Norway, honestly, if you could replace the army commander with De Wiert, and you could replace, probably, <laughs> replace the uh, Lord Corkinori with, I don't know, any of some, some of these officers from this list, honestly. Uh, send Ramsey out to command it. He's a full admiral. Um, in 1939, he is kind of busy. 19, but he's made a full admiral in mid in 1939. He's technically wandering around with nothing to do. In 1940, you could have sent him out to Norway, and he would have been very good for the job. If you'd send him out and you put De Weert in charge of the land forces, you might be talking a very different Norway campaign. But you don't. And that one we can place down to Churchill, really. But we'll leave that to one side. Churchill has good points and Churchill has bad points. I think the problem, as with all people, gets whenever you set someone up and you go, this one is a, this person's a paragon of ill virtue, or this one is a... <laughs> pitiful sin. Very, very few people fit in such bright light or abject darkness. The vast, overwhelming majority of people are on the spectrum in between. And again, that's part of the selection process. If you think about it, when you're selecting admirals to, who mostly retire, you're also looking at the ones who, are they still confident in what they're doing? Are they still capable to perform? How will they deal, especially once you get to more senior ranks, how will they deal with the politics above? You could be a very, very good admiral. If you can't deal with the politics, you're going to get into trouble. Classic example in here, there is a name, Henry Harwood, who is a very good Commodore down in the South Atlantic. That's Fine in the Graf Spain at the Battle of River, uh, River Plate scenario. Comes back, does okay in a staff appointment. Is given a post in the Mediterranean, as CMC. And runs into trouble because he's just not from his experience, because his experience, his career has not involved dealing a lot with the army and the RF. He's never, he doesn't understand that the RF and the army might try and blame their problems on him for political reasons. And is completely unprepared for it. Whereas, and to an extent, the army and the RAF are quite surprised by what happens. Because they're used to a certain level of political infighting. And so far, it hadn't brought an admiral down. And it certainly hadn't, got, you know, because the admiral had fought back. And so that was fine. But suddenly they've got an admiral who doesn't really understand that's what he's supposed to That's part of the, the way it goes. And they win, and then they're in real trouble. They're in real trouble because Cunningham comes back, and he's smack, and he goes frigating on them completely. 
Alex re uh, rearranges the facts of life. And they're sort of going, ouch, that hurt. Because Cunningham can do the politics. Cunningham's a good example of Admiral. He works hard all the way through World War II. When he dies, the story goes, and Andrew Lambert does it, says this much better than I do. Basically, he leaves his club in London, gets into a taxi, sits in the back of the taxi, and by the time they get to the station, he's dead. He just slips off. And again, you have to consider the years of service, what he's done in the war, he's worn out. And he did push on that extra time. He he went from the Mediterranean to being involved in Torch and D-Day and all sorts of things, and then off to First Sea Lord. Yes, there's no one else who could take the role. But one of the reasons there's no one else who can take the role is because so many of the Royal Navy's best admirals die in 1939. Dudley Pound was not supposed to become a First Sea Lord when he did. He takes the post because his predecessors died. Henderson dies. Henderson is the third Sea Lord up to 1939. Henderson is supposed to go on and do other things. They have other posts in mind for him. Yes, he stayed in his stayed as third Sea Lord for a bit too long, but they have commands they want to send him to because he's good at his job. He's one of the officers who's on the line for potentially first Sea Lord. But still, they have to retire officers, because they're worn out. And this is something which we can forget today at our peril. Because the amount of jokes I hear about, oh, you have more admirals than ships. A, that's not really true. And B... Well, there's a problem when you're running a program which costs billions of pounds. Uh, or you're running a program which is the strategic nuclear deterrent for your, entire, for your nation. Uh, do you want some of experience running that post? Yes, probably do. Well, you're not going to keep them around if you say, well, because of politics, you can only ever be a captain. You're going to have to promote them. You're going to have to give them the pay as much as you can in the armed forces and the respect, but also the bureaucratic firepower that comes from having all that gold braid to do their job. And you're also going to have to have people around who can take over some of those roles should people die through either enemy action or being worn out, or unforeseen circumstances in wartime. That's not a post you can afford to parachute someone into who is not up to the task. This does actually lead to quite an interesting scenario in that you almost, you have some roles which I swear are like the chairman of, that, of the Honours and Awards Committee, are there for the sole purpose of having someone available who's got the right level of experience, who, due to that role, is going to be read into a, enough of the of what's going on, so they're going to be able to have enough knowledge about what's going on that they can be parachuted into a role should they be needed. And so you've got someone whose skill and capabilities are far outweighing the post they're in, really. But they're being held there, not because the post requires their capabilities, but because there are lots of other posts which you require backfill for, and you don't want to have to eradicate, take someone out of those one of those posts to fill in another one should you need an emergency, because you need to try and provide continuity of command in those other roles. It boggles the mind, but just as you have are supposed to have reserves 
in terms of equipment, reserves in terms of consumable items, you have to start almost viewing your personnel and senior personnel, NCOs and officers, as a consumable. You will wear them out. You will tire them out. And you might lose them. You might expend them. Even if you don't want to. And then you're going to have a replacement. That's a scary thing for governments to deal with, especially in peacetime when we haven't had a war like that in a long time and everyone's used to the idea of, but we'll all be safe. I'm considered strange. I have a slight problem with Northwood and I have a problem with pretty much all the desire to concentrate command in one place. It makes sense cost-wise, and if you're just thinking of a war on terror or something like that, you can probably do it and do it secure enough. But if you were considering a peer conflict, then putting all your eggs, including your very breakable and fragile egg heads, in one space would seem to me to be a little bit problematic. The lesson of World War II is that you will lose far more senior officers to overexertion than to enemy action. And you will need reserves of them. You will need to be able to promote junior officer, more junior officers to senior roles. There need to going to be ways of accelerating their training, but also of having a large enough pool of officers below there who have the requisite experience that they can be promoted up. But also alongside that, you're going to have to make sure you maintain some kind of force survivability. And your retired officers are a pool of that. But again, it's, are they going to be available? I turn you back to Michael Clapp. If it had been a major war, basically the Cold War had turned hot, I'm sure he would have come back if he'd been asked to. In fact, he could pretty much have been compelled to. There are statutes of law which back that up. But... And I say this, you do have this scenario which might be worthwhile considering today, in that we have all the reserve units. Having a scenario where all officers and all NCOs have to, after they finish their service, do some time in the reserves might be a sensible thing. Especially if we're going to keep cutting the pool of serving personnel down to as shallow as we can. There again, it would be done, uh, the ones who want to do join the reserves anyway, the case can be strongly made for, and also what do you do with them in the reserves, because there's no point having people in there when it's not productive to have them in there. You could, I suppose, set up a shadow staff and a shadow this and a shadow that in, in reserve structure, but again, people would probably soon be sitting there going, but this is a waste of money. So whilst I might support it, I can see it would end in endless political and paper arguments, so there's no point pursuing it. But it means that there's a lot of problems. And there's not really an easy solution. So, I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope you found it an interesting illumination to why officers are allowed to retire during a world war. In fact, some of them are encouraged to retire. And, yeah. Thank you very much for your support. This goes out on a Saturday when I'm at Chalk Valley. And I have absolutely no signal while I'm there. So, hmm. But, Sunday, that is tomorrow when this comes out, I'm at Tank Fest. Woohoo! So, who knows where I'll be wandering around, but I will be at Tank Fest. And I'll be wearing a bright orange t-shirt and an HMC Asida cap. So, if you'd like to see me there, please do spot or hunt for the bright orange t-shirt. And I will be more than happy to say hello. 
thank you again to everyone for your support. Thank you very much, so much for your kindness, and I hope you enjoyed this video. Take care. And I know I started off with some questions, but I think I'm going to finish this with a question of this. How do you go about preserving that experience? What I mean is, in 1939, the Royal Navy has all those retired officers and has a large, far larger service than it does today. Same with the US Navy. They have a large pool of experience they can draw from, and they can call on. So even though they do have people die, even though they do lose people early on, even though they do wear people out, they always have enough people coming through to be able to do it. How do we change that today? How do we build in similar uh, build in resilience without having that same pool, that same group of people? What do you think would be a good idea? And I'd love to see what you write and what you think. Thank you very much for watching, and hope you enjoyed. Take care. Bye. <laughs>